Good morning. Hi, thank you for being here. Hello, Data Bees. We're so excited for today. We have such an amazing uh, panel for you guys. I hope you're excited. Uh, for those of you who are returning, welcome back. And for those of you who are new here today, hi, so nice to meet you virtually. My name is Maddie Watt. I work for The Hive, and I am the Senior Manager of People and Programs at The Hive. And we are going to jump right into today's discussion. But really fast, I just want to go over a couple of ground rules for today's webinar. So this webinar will be recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube page, and it will be sent out automatically tomorrow. So if you have to hop off early or if you have a colleague that couldn't make it for some reason and they want to look at it, um, please share that link with them tomorrow after you receive it in your email. Also, we love questions. We definitely want you guys to ask our panel your most burning uh, questions and make sure that they're hard and that they work for it, right? So definitely ask those questions. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a banner of buttons below all of our little uh, pictures, and you should see a Q&A button there. So if you please ask the question in there, that makes it nice and neat for our moderator, TM Ravi, and it also allows you guys the opportunity to upvote on different questions. So if you see a question that's been asked that you really want to see answered, make sure to upvote it so it trends towards the top. And lastly, if you are going to be following along on social media with today, please use the hashtag HiveData and tag us at HiveData. Okay, so let's jump right into it. So what is the Hive Think Tank? The Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We are bringing you uh, virtual events pretty much every other week, although sometimes we're lucky and we get to do two in a week. So we did that this week and we're actually doing that again next week. So if you are a data bee and you're liking what we're doing, you are in luck because you have a ton of excellent webinars lined up for you. And I will go over those in just a minute. Um, and also I wanna say a special thank you to our sponsors. Next slide, Ravi. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsors, including TIPCO, who we are uh, working on this event with today. So we love to bring a discussion around all things related to digital transformation, AI, blockchain, uh, enterprise solutions revolving around AI and startups, computer vision. So there's a lot of different things that we touch on, and we are so happy to be hosting today's panel. And we have a couple of good ones coming up for you, too. Next slide, Ravi. Thank you. So next Monday, or section next Monday, next Wednesday, we have a really cool event that we're doing about wildfires. If you are based in California or just pretty much anywhere in the world these days, you have probably had some sort of experience with wildfires. So this is going to be a really interesting session. It's actually going to be an hour and a half long because it's a special session. And we are going to look at how different uh, technology innovations are helping with fighting wildfires. Thank you, Ravi. And then the next day, we are doing data sharing for data science. That's going to be a very cool event that's going to speak to uh, the benefits of sharing data, but how to go about that when there's so many different uh, policies and rules and regulations, as well as how to get these very unique and different data sets and how to kind of marry them together to give you the best results from uh, your data as possible and make it more robust. So without further ado, I do want to give the virtual mic over to TM Ravi. He might say a couple more things about the events. Otherwise, he's going to briefly tell you about what the Hive does before we get right into the panel. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Matty. And, and, and this session will cover a lot of the challenges around data fusion also. So any of you data geeks, it would be great if you can, uh, you can uh, join. Um, so very briefly about the Hive, the Hive is a venture capital entity, and in particular, it's, uh, it's a venture studio, which is a subclass of venture capital. So we collaborate with entrepreneurs and corporations to, to uh, start companies, and then we fund these companies. Um, computer vision is a key uh, area for us. And in fact, uh, we have a number of companies uh, uh, focused on it, and and we are doing this um, here in the in the U.S., but um, all across the world. So if you're an entrepreneur, you have some ideas, please do uh, reach out to us. So so um, I'm pleased to be moderating this uh, event today. Um, there's a lot of exciting things for us to talk about in 
in computer vision, kind of how um, cameras can detect anomalies, how it can they can replace human eyes, how they can go beyond kind of human eyes, and and you know across all um, uh, phases, you know it could be kind of analytics and insights, it could be control, it could be autonomy, and so joining me today uh, are an awesome panel. And so I let them introduce themselves, uh, Nelson. Sure, I'll uh, I'll start. Uh, thanks, Ravi, and thanks, Maddie. Uh, always happy. I'm Nelson Petrachik, the CTO of Tipco Software. I'm always happy to be part of an event from the Hive. They have some great events. Uh, me uh, being in Western Canada, we've been under smoke for uh, most of the summer. So the event on uh, the fires and, and detecting fires, early detection, and so on that that's going to be a fascinating event. So definitely very uh, very timely and relevant. Um, for those of you that don't know TIBCO, just a quick sentence, um, we, uh, we deal with data. We're an infrastructure software company, been around for uh, 20 plus years. Uh, if you've ever shipped a package, if you've ever taken a flight, uh, a lot of the healthcare organizations run our software. Uh, it's really around connecting the data, moving data, analyzing data, and managing data. So that really is a, a key focus area or set of focus areas for us. And uh, computer vision is a key element of that. Uh, we do a lot of work in areas like high-tech manufacturing, transportation logistics, supply chain organizations, uh, airports, a uh, number of customers of ours, and, and computer vision is definitely a hot topic for, uh, for most of those organizations, if not all. So we're, we're involved in a, in a number of projects as it pertains to data. Um, when it comes to computer vision, I can barely take a good picture with my iPhone, but everything after that, we, uh, we help handle and process uh, what happens with those images and video feeds after the fact. So, so definitely happy to uh, be part of this discussion today. Thank, thank you, Nelson. Sastri? Yeah, thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Maddie, and thanks, Nelson. So I'm Sastri Malati, happy to be part of this uh, panel, as always, with uh, these Hive panels. And uh, I'm currently the CTO uh, of Foggon Systems, a Hive portfolio company. We focus on providing edge AI machine learning capabilities is particularly in the industrial segment and in some other cases, transportation and energy sectors as well. The idea being as Nelson pointed out is that how do you use a camera to augment the existing sensors to do computer vision to identify various uh, anomalies, various use cases, which we're gonna to touch on during the panel. I've been in the technology space for 30 plus years, big and small companies in an entrepreneur as well, but uh, looking forward to the conversation with you all. Thanks. Thank you, David. Yeah, hi, uh, happy to be here as well. I'm David Austin. I'm a senior principal engineer and data scientist at, at Intel. I assume most of the audience has heard of uh, Intel before, uh, but you know, my interest in the industrial space, I, I've worked in the industrial space for 20 years, the last five or six of that almost exclusively in, in computer vision. And part of my job and my interest and, and passion really is, you know, how do we bring computer vision and AI solutions to life at large scale? I mean, Intel's a scale company. We like doing things large scale across the world in the global environment. That's how we make our money. And my job is to figure out working with our partners and, and customers, how do we do that? How do we take, you know, these small scale lab problems and turn them into large scale solutions. And so, so that, that, that's what I, I like to do. Um, you know, when my day job is done, I shut down my laptop and I open up my, my home servers and I, I compete in AI competitions and challenges. And so if there's anything uh, as a, such as an AI addict, it, it's probably myself. And so I hope to bring some perspective in terms of, you know, the solution generation to you folks. Good. So, so today what we'll do is kind of break up the session into kind of four parts. One, we'll talk about kind of the technology and technology challenges. Um, second, um, I think uh, a discussion around applications, there's a wide range of applications. Um, third, um, chat about kind of the advanced uses, the future of kind of where this is all going. And then we'll put aside uh, in the last section some time for, for audience Q&A. So audience members, there's a Q&A button there. Please uh, go for it and we will get to your, your questions. So, so let's, let's get started with um, kind of technology. And, and so maybe David, I don't know, do you want to get, uh, do you want to start and, and talk about kind of what you see as sort of big advances in technology that have enabled kind of uh, the applications that we'll talk about later? 
Yeah, sure. You know, uh, so so the thing that I work most closely with and, and can identify with is, you know, the transformation that's happening right now, you know, from what I would say is traditional computer vision with uh, RGB cameras moving towards more, you know, AI and deep learning based solutions. You know, uh, I think it's important to think about this, you know, in the sense of, AI is a tool, it's a great tool, right? It, it can change the game, it doesn't always, we always have to pick the right tool for the right job at the right time. So, you know, but with that caution, uh, there's definitely an emerging trend, high interest, being able to solve these problems where we're identifying, you know, anomalies and factories that are, you know, literally down to three and four pixels that can distinguish something that's good or something that's bad on a part. It's it's truly quite amazing. Uh, I mean, computer vision is great at doing things that humans can't do when you talk about repetitive tasks at small scale. And we're now reaching the point where both the algorithms and the computer are allowing us to do this in a scale type fashion. And so, you know, that that is clearly on the radar with emerging trends, companies growing in, in into that field, creating custom solutions around that. So, you know, that that's something that I see, you know, being adopted literally, you know, every day. And I guess the, one of the big enablers is just the phone. I don't know if you can see my phone uh, and just kind of the commoditization of, of cameras. Any, any, any thoughts uh, around that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we do see that. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely see that too. It, yeah, it, it, David brings up a good point, but it, the the infrastructure and the capabilities of the devices uh, is definitely grown. So you have more capability at a cheaper price. And so we, for example, now have the ability and, and we're doing this where we can actually run machine learning models, as David is talking about, but run them on the camera. And it really is around, well, how can I, you know, before I would take a bunch of images and I would send them somewhere, data center, cloud, whatever it might be, analyze them, make some decisions and send them back, send the, send the answer back. Oh, by that time, that, that stop sign, I've long passed that, right? Or that, that, that poorly made piece of equipment on the factory floor, it's, it's long on, gone on to the next step. That simply takes too long. And so you're seeing this evolution of capabilities being pushed out more and more to the edge as that technology evolves, as the hardware evolves, as the communications infrastructure evolves, and as the data science behind it actually all evolves as well. So we now can splice off kind of parts of models and run them at the edge. And, and that enables us to do that. So this, we, we used to, we go through waves, right? You go through this, let's centralize everything. Let's decentralize everything. And let's centralize everything again. And now we're back into this mode of, well, let's decentralize everything again, because we can't bring all data back to the cloud, make our decisions and then push the answer back. It's exactly right. I would just add to, you, to what Nelson and David said, right? Technology advancements, both you guys have been talking about cameras, right? Significant advancements in the camera technologies, compute power being added to them, as well as these mobile devices. In fact, almost every single one of these devices has a GPU. Many of you actually may not even know the GPU embedded in it, especially with the ARM-based processes in there. So you can run machine learning, but that's only one side of the equation. I'd like to point out that there is also a second side of the technology advancements, which is to say, yes, you've got these cameras and compute power, but there is equally significant advancements in the machine learning technology itself, the neural nets, the deep learning. How do you then optimize to get more juice of these compute devices out there? Things like pre-training optimizations, post-training optimizations, there's auto slim. If you look at all of these educational institutions across the globe, significant advancement in terms of how to leverage while the compute power is getting cheaper and commoditized, how to then further get more juice out of it by advancing this machine learning technologies. So it's really, really interesting point for AI to be adopted across many, many use cases. I know sometimes it appears that AI is a buzzword these days, but really if you really peel the onion, there are specific scenarios in which AI makes sense. It is a means to an end, but it definitely makes sense and, uh, in many scenarios. What's David, what's the state of art, which is, when it comes to recognizing objects, recognizing actions, um, uh, and and in some sense doing that in a way that generalizable and scalable, um, where are we? Yeah, you know, we're making advances literally every two or three months. We're hitting a new state of the art benchmark on, you know, some, you know, ImageNet or, or, or Coco data set. And so the modeling side of AI is continuing to advance, but I would say, you know, it's starting to slow down. We're now seeing, you know, gains on the order of tenths of percent, uh, uh, 0.2%, rather than these large, you know, multi-percent gains that we were seeing in years past. So, 
you know, the modeling side of things, I think it's continuing to progress, but the rate of change is slowing down. Where I think most of the advancements coming from, and this is, you know, where some a lot of the, the pain points that we feel in practical applications is really on the data side. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of advancements, a lot of new tooling, both open source and some close source proprietary solutions on helping us, you know, clean the data, uh, generate label consistency, have clean data ops pipeline. So the data that we're feeding into these systems are good because, you know, with any AI based model, they're very good at learning a certain data space. They're not very good at extrapolating outside of that data space. So data is so important and so crucial here. And so, you know, I think we have to think about it from both ends, both the data side and the modeling side. And I would say right now, the data side of things is advancing maybe at a little bit higher rate than, than the modeling side. Uh, Sastri, uh, data challenges, data fusion challenges, uh, what are your thoughts, model challenges? Model yeah, challenges? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think I agree with what David was saying, but the data challenges are significant. We see this almost day to day as we work with many, many customers. A lot of the times, number one is getting access to the data. Like if you go into an industrial environment, you've got a manufacturing process, you've got an oil rig, you've got some other process. Number one, how do you get access to it, right? So let's say we get around that challenge. The number two, how do you actually label that? As David pointed out, that it's not enough for you to just have the data set. The data set has to be labeled to identify which aspects are actually good, which aspects are bad in order for the machine learning model to, to learn from it. Many a times what happens to these customers are collecting the data. Sometimes they're even storing it so we can have access to it but they're not labeling it. Now, if you go back and ask them, hey, like which, which of this point in time was actually a, a failure condition, they are not able to pinpoint, right? This is where now we begin to go up, say, look, forget the history. Now we're gonna start collecting the data now and start labeling it too. Those are significant challenges. And the third challenge, which somewhat we can, we, we get around this and I'll explain how, is really there's just lack of data. You know, these industrial environments are not sophisticated enough to collect the data or have provide you this live access to the data. So then what are we left with? We have to synthesize this data. This is synthetic data augmentation generation. We use things like gaming engine. For example, you've got an oil rig or if you've got a manufacturing process that's manufacturing a different part, you don't have data for it. Now you get one or two pictures of it. Now how do you then model and augment and segment it and synthesize these images? You need hundreds of thousands of these images as if it's a live video camera. That's kind of what we do. So in some cases, you know, work with labeling vendors or work with the customer to figure out how to label this and more importantly, how to synthesize it so that it's got enough information in it for the model to be successfully, reasonably accurately predicting the specific anomalies that we're looking for. Nelson, thoughts on uh, data, uh, you know, uh, synthetic data? Yeah, I mean, it's um, definitely we're seeing, especially in areas such as uh, hospitals, healthcare, uh, the ability to actually create synthetic data that represents patients, uh, patient symptoms, uh, especially for circumstances where you have uh, conditions that are, are not that well known and you don't have a lot of data on that. Um, synthetic data generation can be very, very helpful to simulate what you might be getting from medical equipment, wearables, uh, other devices that might be now used, including computer vision, uh, to monitor uh, patients. And so uh, it, you, you definitely do see an interest in this. There's this interesting convergence uh, between simulation, digital twins, synthetic data generation, uh, the creation of these models, the distribution of these models, uh, you know, this in itself could be a, a topic for the rest of the hour, absolutely. But, you know, I, we do see that as organizations look to build more complex models um, or try and build models that represent areas that are maybe a little more uh, unknown or where you just, uh, you know, a hospital or, or medical uh, facility may not have that much data. Um, synthetic data generation does become important. It, it also becomes important for things like privacy. So if you think about how, uh, you know, computer vision, so you've got cameras, you've got cameras monitoring people. Um, so are there privacy considerations around that? What does that look like? And in some cases, actually, there's less considerations, even though you're using cameras that are might be using other techniques. And so, you know, how do you blend that world, the security aspects of that, um, and then combine that with, you know, digital twins, which might be used for simulation purposes or for actually running in parallel to the models and, and whatnot that you're actually executing. And so you've got kind of the virtual aspect of it running alongside the real aspect of it being used to feed data into the synthetic data generators, which are being used to train the models, which are then being used to push out to the edge to make it more accurate. 
Um, I don't know if I described that in, in three sentences uh, well, but, but that there, there is a lot of synergies and work in the, around combining those different approaches. And, and computer vision is one mechanism uh, and one input, if you will, into that type of process, right? In this case, for improving the overall patient care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I may just add one point to Ravi, if I may, you know, data fusion, you, you brought up this point as well. This is extremely important. You walk into any environment, industrial, hospitals, commercial, construction sites, doesn't matter, all, the, all, all of it, is that sometimes even though they have existing some sensor capabilities, that in itself, either one, it may not be enough, may not be accessible, including things like vibration sensors. So what cameras are helping really is to augmenting the existing sensors that they may already have and fuse the data between the two together. For example, you have your temperature, pressure, flow rate, vibration. How do you then combine and fuse that with camera images to exactly glean the insights that you're looking for? This is an extremely important <laughs> aspect that we should not, um, uh, should not uh, undermine that. It's wonderful. Yeah, right. that, that's actually a good point because uh, actually Intel and TIPCO um, in the retail space, as an example, and, and as we're broadening in this out, we're moving into the manufacturing space just to, to start with some use cases, but uh, loss prevention uh, in the retail space is a big deal. And uh, so this is combining computer vision. Let, let's even take the simple uh, at the checkout. Um, it's combining computer vision. What is that individual doing at the checkout? Uh, whether it's the person or the act, uh, or the employee, one of the two, right? You don't necessarily, uh, you want to make sure they're checking things out appropriately, let's say. Uh, you're not chanting, scanning the uh, cheap bottle of wine twice, uh, as opposed to the one expensive, one cheap. Uh, so those kinds of things. And you're combining that, though, with things like the weight of the product. You're combining it with, of course, the, uh, the reading of the barcodes. And, you know, all these inputs are being brought together and then mashed up and to try and detect loss in, in this particular context. And so, yeah, it's definitely that fusion between all these different sensors. It's no longer just, hey, I wanna process this feed from one sensor and make a decision based on that, on that data value. Uh, it's actually now a, a variety of things being brought in. And uh, that in itself leads to a whole other set of, of issues, concerns, and considerations. But, but the sensor fusion, data fusion, it's a key element of what, uh, what we do see organizations now adopting and looking at. Um, uh, uh, you know, both uh, Intel and Fogon have a big stake in Edge. Obviously, Intel would like a chip everywhere. And, and so, so this has to do with kind of uh, models and, and the need for kind of closed loop control, quick decision making um, in, in kind of wherever the camera is, is located. How, how, how do you think of sort of cloud-based versus Edge-based models the training of this, the updating of it, um, and, and accompanying kind of data volumes, privacy, those kinds of issues. Sastri? Yeah, I can say from a perspective. So this is a very important point you bring up, Ravi. So typically, even when you go build a machine learning model, train it offline, and they're perfectly working fine, deploy this in edge device, controlling a particular asset when there is a failure, for example, right? What happens over time, we all know this, just like everything else in life, things do change. There's going to be data variation. There's going to be environmental changes or machine behavior changes. As a result, that exact same model that once used to accurately work may no longer work, may begin to drift. So you have to have mechanisms in place to identify and detect those data drifts for various reasons. And then what do you do, right? Obviously you need to have the model relearn or incrementally learn again. And that can be done in one of two ways. One is that if you have connectivity to the cloud, or if you need have a beefier machine where you can incrementally train the model, then you automatically, when the drift is detected, send the raw data around that time period into this central location where you have a chance to automatically retrain the model and then push the model back onto the edge to, to, to continue to make it better. But many times, especially in sensitive environments, they may not have any cloud connectivity like that. So this is where we have local resources. Customers use local BPR boxes in some cases to do this incremental sort of reinforcement learning to continue to affect that. So this is actually what we call closed loop machine learning or in some cases AI, which is to say, how do you self-correct, self-adjust the drift in the data, drift in machine behavior in order for us to continue to predict with the same level of accuracy as it once did. This is a very important aspect. Otherwise, you could be shutting down a machine or stopping a process you know, prematurely without actually knowing what's going on. David? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree with that. You know, and, and, and part of the premise there is that we actually have these sensing mechanisms in place. Uh, what I find more often than not in real environments is that it's just assumed that the model is going to run in perpetuity and not have any drift, and, and we don't have these in place. So, you know, to your fundamental question around, you know, cloud or edge, you know, I, I think we have to take as, as designers and developers of these solutions a somewhat agnostic approach. In some cases, it makes all the sense we've got to do all of that on the edge. I mean, we just can't move this data to the cloud and retrain. We can detect on the edge, right? We can retrain uh, in the cloud. Doesn't matter, right? Our job is to put the right compute at the right place at the right time at the lowest cost. I mean, that from a design thinking perspective, I think that that's largely how it needs to work. But I would say this is kind of an often overlooked aspect of you know AI deployment, the, the, the full life cycle that we're talking about here. And in, in many environments, you know, where connectivity is poor, I'll just take a kind of a car, for example, and cameras on a car, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, the possibility of a kind of a smart camera with chips and uh, edge and AI all embedded, where at most, you know, there's incremental updates going on to the camera, but a lot of the decision making on can be done in the camera itself seems like a pretty plausible application. It is, in fact, we just did exactly that use case, um, Ravi, that uh, with Porsche, one of the use cases we did was, this is a publicly announced, so I can talk about it, which is, you know, secu this is a security use case. There is actually an ECU in the car itself, right? There's compute power, and uh, they actually install these rare um, rear view mirror cameras as well as other cameras around the car, and then the signals from it actually get fed into the ECU running in the car, where our model that we built actually runs in the car to identify. In this particular case, we're actually trying to identify if this is the owner of the car, plus this is not a fake picture, things like that. One of the common things, I hadn't even realized that, even if you, somebody, we do facial recognition for an owner, somebody's entering the car, most of the time what happens is if you print the picture of the owner, if you happen to know the person, paste it in your face, the computer vision model is gonna detect, yeah, this is the owner, right? But how do you then, you know, how do you actually use thermal imaging to identify this is not a real face, this is actually a picture. So we combine thermal imaging plus the real camera and run it in the ECU to do that. You have absolutely no possibility there to send all of this to the cloud and then decide, make a decision, bring it back down there. It's just not even possible. Yeah. Let's, on, on that note, let's kind of switch gears to kind of the main topic, which is applications. And maybe I was thinking um, we could just kind of each of you kind of cover um, you know, uh, uh, section of these application areas, and then then we can kind of try to cover the rest as a group. Nelson, do you want to uh, start and kind of where do you see applications of cameras and computer vision? Uh, sure. Uh, why don't I, I'll start with the obvious one. Uh, we've talked about this one, and then we can move into some of the more uh, emerging uh, use cases. Um, the, the first obvious ones that you typically see are really around quality and quality control. So whether you're a high-tech manufacturer and you're actually monitoring uh, the chips as they move down the fab lines and you're looking for things like cracks, uh, if you are monitoring the creation of solar panels, and again, you're looking for cracks or other defects in those panels as they're getting uh, formed into um, you know, broader, uh, broader pieces of equipment, if you will, that are gonna be deployed out in the field or, or wherever. Uh, we've had a use case around a bakery, which was actually using computer vision to monitor the quality of the bread that was being made. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of use cases which are really around yield, quality control, uh, and the idea that you wanna try and identify any issues or concerns early in the process rather than later. Um, or even the, uh, the the materials that go into making uh, the silicone and, and the wafers, and you know there's that whole supply chain as well. If you catch defects in the raw materials earlier in the supply chain rather than later, that's obviously going to be better for you as well. So those those are some of the very stereotypical kinds of use cases that that people will talk about. Uh, you know, I think the um, you know the one that has emerged now has really been driven by uh, the pandemic. Uh, really uh, using computer vision to monitor things like where and how people are are uh, you know are complying. Are they complying to rules and regulations? Are they grouped together in a certain area within a building? You know, there's those kinds of use cases now that people are interested in. Uh, we do a lot of work with airports and things like that. So that's that's kind of the situations that they're uh, interested in as well as more detecting uh, patterns of, of movement, if you will. So I'll, I'll start with those two and uh, let, let the, uh, the other folks contribute. But those are the basic ones that people usually think about uh, when you think about computer vision. Yeah, I, I would uh, certainly second your uh, 
uh, your top one there, Nelson, uh, you know, in terms of quality inspection, although, although I'll, I'll put a slight twist on that. Um, certainly what I see most happening in the industry right now is, the, you know, replacing eyeballs with cameras for quality inspection makes all makes all the sense in the world. But I think the way people are starting to view this more than a, a typical classification task, you know, is my part good or is it bad, but framing it more as an anomaly detection task. Because when you do that, the type of AI and the learning that you do can be very different. We can move into, uh, you know, more advanced topics, which I won't go into here, but, you know, just a teaser for the audience. I mean, you can go look into these concepts uh, between supervised and unsupervised learning. We can overcome a lot of the barriers to scale like the we're talking about previously, right? We never have enough data. We don't have our rare classes, thing, things that prevent us from creating the solutions. When we reframe those quality problems into an anomaly detection task, we actually can start moving further down the road to adoption. So I think I think that's a that's a trend that that's happening in the industry right now. Um, you know, another uh, area that I think is uh, rife for uh, on the application front is actually starting to rethink about how we monitor activity that's happening in the factory and have more of a continuous view of it. So, you know, it's very easy to monitor a piece of equipment that would I have a hundred sensors on, or, you know, I can measure the quality of the output of the material moving through my factory. But, you know, so much of the work in the world in factories is, is happening by humans. Uh, you know, we can also do things like monitor how people are performing their activities. You know, we can change, we can now have a pose estimation and activity recognition systems that can look at a worker even from overhead, not even, not even having to do head on. So you can do things like preserve privacy, but based on the motions of the worker and how they're doing things, you can infer things like, um, you know, availability of a station, output, uh, things that you would normally monitor as part of machines, you can monitor cohesively everything that's going on in the factory. So that's another way that people are using computer vision and, and AI beyond just the typical, you know, activity recognition or, or quality inspection. And, and that's an emerging trend, I think. And, and broadly thinking of that in the business process context, um, not just the industrial floor, you see the use of RPA uh, where, uh, where you know, RPA is basically in, in many applications uh, using a camera, looking at what keystrokes someone is doing in a business process, and then kind of using scripts or other things trying to automate the, the process. So yeah. along the lines of sure. Yeah, just to add to what uh, Nelson and David mentioned, right? There's, I, we see this as four different categories. Obviously the first one talked about quite a bit, quality inspection. I would also uh, expand that into you know, more yield improvement, you know, scrap reduction, both in process as well as discrete. When you're talking about a manufacturing plant where the, the anomalies could be in the process itself or the anomalies could be in the products that are produced. So there is a clear distinction between a process as well as a discrete manufacturing. And this significant uh, computer vision based uh, applications are there. The other three areas I will, I will also touch on. One is, especially in the oil and gas industry, you know, these are all remote areas. You've got on, on, onshore and offshore drilling processes, and then there is flaring as part of gas refinement. Typically, flaring occurs. This is actually problematic. World Bank is very closely watching based on the EPA regulations on for net zero, zero emissions. How do you do that? So computer vision, again, comes to play there. Computer vision, using that, augmenting that with their existing sensors, proactively monitoring for, you know, flaring and be able to alert it. In some cases, actually predicting when potentially flaring is going to occur and be able to prevent that as well. So those are and, and then safety issues. When the drilling is happening, sometimes when there is a BOP, uh, you want to stop drilling, for example. Today, what the operator does is that they're going to just blindly stop and shear the pipe for drilling. That's going to be catastrophic. Now, how do you then use computer vision? This is one of the use cases we've done as well. Computer vision to identify for the operator exactly to tell when to stop the drilling process to prevent any catastrophes, right? Those are one class of use cases. The another class I would say is as Nelson briefly touched on it, which is this concept of safe health and safety. Obviously, with COVID, we have seen all of this social distancing, mask. If somebody's wearing a mask or not, somebody's got elevated temperature or not. These are all pretty common use cases that that are there using computer vision. But beyond that, is really a safety suite, especially whether it's a construction site environment, a gas plant environment, a rig environment, a manufacturing environment. People have to watch out for certain safety aspects. They have to wear a hard hat. They have to wear a harness or you know, a life vest. Or in some cases, if they're working with cranes, you got to make sure that there is a flagman and then they're wearing a harness before. If the flagman is not there, you can't go under that. Or if you're walking under a heavy 
uh, lifting uh, objects, crane lifting heavy objects, you got to watch out for that. So there is a whole suite of applications that, that we see uh, we built and for many customers on safety aspects. But one last thing I would say, something new that, uh, that we have now been able to leverage AI and ML is this whole energy sector, which actually runs under the net zero carbon emissions uh, as well. If you look at utility bills across the buildings in the planet, whether it's US or anywhere else, most of the time, you know, a lot of the times the HVAC systems, the heating, cooling, all of this thing is all running, right? But even when there is nobody in there, right? Or if somebody wants an after hours, um, you know, they want access to a gym or an auditorium or because they've got an SAT class or something, what happens is because it's not automatic, they'll keep the, the lights on, they'll keep the HVAC on all the time, which is costing significant money. Now, this is where we apply AI and one of two things. One is giving an interface to the user to simply express a reservation system on exactly when they're gonna occupy, when they need a particular facility. But that's not, that's not the main point. The real point was when they actually tell you that, let's say somebody says, I need something at 8 p.m. today, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. I've got a basketball game. I need to heat up this, light up this auditorium. It's not enough if you just turn on the HVAC system and the building automation system at eight o'clock. Guess what? How do you know what time does it take for the BMS building automation system to bring down the set point, the temperature to the desired where exactly by eight o'clock? This is where we apply machine learning to identify, considering the external weather conditions, historical performance of the HVAC and the building automation system to control that. There is significant millions of dollars of savings in each and every building scenario in that application. So this is another area where we're seeing significant uptick in the application of AI to control these building automation systems. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a series of these, isn't there? I mean, the um, uh, drones, I mean, we've got situations where drones are flying over fields for the purposes of crop inspections. Uh, and then all that information is being captured on, on computer uh, vision uh, capabilities and then it's getting fed back to models, which are then being used to optimize how the crops are growing under those conditions, which obviously requires a lot of other sensors. So yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, we, we could probably go on and on and on in terms of the, uh, the number of use cases that are seen or emerging. The last one that I'd like to bring up is really just around uh, knowledge capture. And I, I saw this as a, uh, a question actually in the, either the chat or the Q&A, um, but using computer vision as a way to capture the knowledge of a worker. Because in certain industries, a lot of these workers are retiring and you cannot put them in a room and ask them, no, please explain to me what you do. Right. They, they can't do that. It's, it's really hard to explain under every certain condition, circumstance and so on and so forth, what it is that they do in response to what it is that they're seeing. Um, but if you can somehow combine and this is where you get into some of this mixed reality, augmented reality, computer vision sort of capabilities, if you can blend that together capture a bit more you know, from a again, computer vision standpoint, what it is that that individual does and more importantly, how they respond that's very valuable information because um, it is going to be very hard. I mean, you talk about industry 5.0 and uh, the blending of humans and robots and things like this, right? Um, so how are we going to start to blend those worlds if we can't understand some of the complexities around what it is that people are doing? And I'm not saying that we're replacing people with robots. That's not the intent here. But how can we capture some of the knowledge um, that these people have? Uh, because there, there's industries that are losing this knowledge. Uh, oil and gas is a great example. Um, uh, power grids, you know, the people that are managing, monitoring, making sure that the power grids are up and running. You know, when this light turns yellow and this button says 10 and this one, whatever it is, that combination, people just know because they just know they've been around for 30 years. But how do you capture that knowledge? And computer vision can definitely be a one way uh, that you can help facilitate that. So I just want to bring that up. It's an interesting one that we've seen that recently. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I would add maybe a contrarian view to this as well. Uh, you know, Sastri and, and Nelson bring up a, a wide range of very interesting emerging applications. Um, and, and I agree with all those. But I would also argue they only matter if we can do them, you know, at a low enough cost and a, a low enough implementation time that there's value to, to, to bring those to life. Um, there, there's a virtual graveyard of projects like this that start and then we realize, well, you know, this takes too long or I, I don't have enough data or this is going to cost way too much money. I'm never going to be able to sustain it. So, you know, we have to look at these use cases also through the lens of not just what's possible, but how do we lower the cost and the implementation time so it's something reasonable, right? If you're a factory manager today and you wanna go and implement an AI-based solution to you know, monitor workers or monitor quality, 
you know, it, it's going to take you two or three months, probably at a minimum. It's going to cost you a lot in terms of data. Chances are you don't have a team of data scientists sitting on the sidelines. And so, you know, there's some of these practical barriers that come back in that we have to layer back on top of these use cases and say, okay, does this make sense? And if not, what are those barriers and, and how do we lower those barriers enough? I, I, I'm a big believer that AI is only going to take off uh, when people like me get removed from the equation, okay? Uh, I, I tell my manager all the time, as a data scientist, part of my job is to eliminate my job, lower the barrier of entry. So subject matter experts, people who really understand this stuff, who see the, the data on a day-to-day -day basis, who knows what types of insights they're trying to get, can when they can create their own solutions, then we're gonna really have something that's powerful. I think the software ecosystem is starting to show signs of life in, in that regards, but I think we always have to look at these applications, you know, with a, with a bit of a skeptical lens and say, okay, you know, can I really go do this? Can I implement this at a reasonable cost and in a reasonable amount of time? So that's a good segue into Ravi, if I may, a couple of minutes, right, into what I was gonna mention, which is to say, it's extremely important to do this only if the use case is repeatable in nature, right? If you're doing a one-off use case, you're right in the sense that the cost of implementation, data collection implementation, you know, time to market is just significantly high enough that the customer might walk away, it may not be worth it, which is why it's really important to say, which of these use cases are repeatable in nature that more than one customer, more than one, potentially one scenario can use that. However, that brings up a very interesting challenge that we run this every single day, which is this. Let's say you have, you have, you have, you have manufacturing plant or you have a worker construction site. You built a solution, built a machine learning model, perfectly detecting exactly what you want to detect. Guess what? When you take that solution to the next customer, who again, the same scenario, a construction site, a plant or a, whatever you're talking about, and it may not detect, this model may not detect exactly the anomalies or the issues that in that second scenario, why? because something is different about it. It's not exactly the same background. It's not exactly the same scenario. And, and as an example, take player monitoring, you, you, you have, which is a very common example. The background and how things look in, in one country, one location is very different from how it looks in the second country, right? How do you do that? This is where one of the innovations we're actually bringing to the table here is how do you provide a simple, not a data scientist, if you require a data scientist to do this, you already lost the battle. You can't require a data scientist to reprogram the thing. How do you provide a simple user interface to the customer, the second and the third and the fourth customers that they can self-upload a snapshot, a snippet of some of those images, and then the system is able to, and then label them, system is able to use that to incrementally retrain to detect exactly what they want to locally detect. This is where we've been seeing some success for scale, but otherwise, Scaling is going to be really, really hard, even for exact same use case across multiple customers. Let's let's. Uh, I want to give some time to um, uh, the next two topics. So let's kind of switch gears. There's a lot we can talk about, by the way, in 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 applications and use cases. So uh, my favorite one, which I hope we can get to in the end, is around uh, in, as an enabler of autonomy. But we'll come back to that. Um, so, so let's just kind of spend a few minutes and maybe David, starting with you on kind of where are we going with this? What's the future of, uh, uh, of this, both from model perspective, where are cameras going? What kind of new uh, developments are happening with cameras? Do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of, of places where I think it's, it's very natural for us to go because the you know, where we have technology solutions that help us overcome, you know, our current barriers, uh, the, there's a natural driving force pushing, pushing in that direction. I kind of alluded to it before, um, you know, I, I think what we're going to see is more of uh, AI based solutions and computer vision moving more from supervised to unsupervised. So training where I don't have necessarily context uh, to my label. So for, so in a manufacturing environment, let's say what that means is, well, rather than train uh, a model based on, you know, my 10 different defect modes, now I can only train it on good parts. And I'm going to learn, you know, to find differences from that, that state of good and anything different from that, I know it's going to be bad. Um, there, there's a whole host of barriers that drop right down when we move to that, that type of uh, solution. And we're starting to see 
those models perform a lot better. Traditionally, they've been very difficult to converge. It's very difficult to design this, uh, what's called this latent space in between encoders and decoders of networks. And, and so there's technology solutions that are coming about now out of the research field that are helping us solve those types of problems. So I, I think we're definitely going to see the modeling side of computer vision go, go in that direction. You know, more on the hardware and camera side, um, I, I'm personally a believer that we're going to look back to these days and, and talk about, oh my gosh, remember back in the 2020s when we just used RGB? cameras you know i i think multi-spectral imaging is really going to be a wave of the future there's just so much more that we can see whether it be in food packaging or satellite imagery uh by by having more dimensions to our data and and the cost of creating the, those hardware-based solutions and cameras are starting to lower as well and so i think that's why we're going to see those more mainstream as, as the cost comes down and the technology you know to be able to infer from that type of data goes up so those are two things i really have my my eye on right now Nelson, um, your thoughts on on the future of um, and I'll, I'll 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 throw sort of something your way, mixed reality, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting data sources from different places, AR, VR. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to some of the original uh, comments we were making about things like sensor fusion, data fusion. You know, it, it'll be more than just. Uh, images sent faster, I guess, is really what we've got right now with a lot of the cameras, right? Um, it will be augmented with additional types of um, images, if you will, infrared and, and so on and so forth. But uh, it'll also then be this much more blending, if you will, of sort of the digital and physical worlds where you have that mixed reality experience, which is augmenting what it is that either an individual is doing, working on, or as I mentioned earlier, for things like knowledge capture. Um, there's a comment, uh, one of the Q&A comments um, around it being expensive. It, it is expensive right now. Uh, you don't see a lot of very large scale rollouts of the use of AR uh, in, in this context. It, it typically is rolled out for things like training. Uh, you see a lot of usage of, of augmented reality, mixed reality, and so on in, in that sense. But I, we start to see now and, and will continue to see, I think, uh, again, this blending of the digital and physical worlds where augmented reality, mixed reality, you know, whatever, whatever XR you want to call it, um, being brought forward to more use cases, whether it's healthcare related, whether it's related to industry, whether it's related to warehousing, uh, even just verifying and, and getting information overlaid something else in real time, uh, I think will also be uh, something that people do start to adopt more and more. Um, uh, we've seen it around uh, maintenance as an example, maintenance procedures, right? Things like that. So, you know, it's, it's more than just gaming. Uh, it um, uh, obviously a lot of the technology and, and Sastri made a, a great example of using gaming technology and applying that to uh, this industrial context. And so you'll see that same thing where augmented reality won't just be for gaming anymore. It'll be brought again into some of these more enterprise related use cases and, uh, and not just be images sent to you faster. <laughs> uh, Sastri, any, any, anything you wanted to add? Yeah, so I just, I, I concur with them. So what, what's two points, which is summarize. One is technology is obviously advancing both on the camera side. In addition to the video cameras, where we see a lot of traction because we got to augment this with thermal imaging, which is really important. And then spectral analysis. There are cameras that do actually, you know, spectrometry, right? But the challenge there, as Nelson pointed out, I mean, just to give you an idea, it, pick any brand, at least 100K plus, each of these cameras that are actually going to be able to detect specific spectral uh, uh, range, for example, detect a methane or a carbon dioxide or a carbon monoxide, these are still highly expensive. This is where we start to figure out how to, without requiring those expensive cameras, how can we still use RGB plus thermal plus some computer vision? Can we still do that, right? This is where there's still a lot of research going on, but uh, yep. Great. I'm going to jump this. Lots of questions. For those of you who have asked questions in the Q&A, uh, if you can uh, ask them in the, uh, who have asked in the chat, if you can ask them in Q&A, it'll make my job easier. So I'll, I'll start with um, a question from our good friend, uh, Jason. Um, and uh, one of you, maybe if you can uh, pick it up. What does the next generation of human in the loop for model reoptimization look like for vision AI? It does seem that we are making, uh, uh, it does not seem like we're making progress relative to capture and tagging job shops. Yeah, if we can just chime in on that. Hi, Jason, thanks for the question. So, you know, 
the closest thing that we are making progress, I see that where the progress is happening in the industry is really after the model training has been done, right? Now, once you models start detecting it, you've got you know, good and bad results coming out, but how does the model know what is good, what is bad? This is where some sort of an interface without a human being um, involved that can automatically be labeled to say, look, this particular scenario, this is actually what's bad, and then feed that into, into the model training. We've been able to do that to some extent, not completely automated because this is still at the beginning of the research. And that's how I see eliminating potentially the human in the loop for incremental retraining of the model in order for us to continue to predict with the same level of accuracy. But there is, there's more to be done there. Yeah, one, one thing I, I would add to that if I can, uh, I, I think, I personally think a underutilized piece of technology um, that should be more prevalent in the industry that helps not eliminate, but drop the human in the loop from where it is today to maybe 10% of that is in the field of active learning, right? Uh, you know, fundamentally, uh, you, you know, when we train these models with, with all this data, the reality is the model is really only learning from about one to 10% of that data that's truly informing the difference in features between, you know, different classes. Um, active learning is this, this field that says, hey, I can pick out ahead of time, a priori, what are those one to 10% of data that matters the most? And then if I only have the human label those, I can get almost as good as if I had labeled everything. So, so I don't know of a great way to completely eliminate that, but there is, you know, I, I believe, underutilized technology that really help drop that, that burden down significantly. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, I'll make one last comment on it then, I guess, before we can move on. But the, um, I mean, we call it augmenting what the human is doing, not necessarily eliminating the human. So I, I, that, that's something that we see as, as very, uh, a key key element of this. But I think the, the knowledge capture and the behavioral analysis is where the human in the loop can really help uh, augment what the models themselves are doing. So if we can watch what the individual is doing and capture that information again through techniques like computer vision, uh, and eventually as, as we get more ac access to things like augmented reality capabilities that are cheaper, better, faster, uh, that, that can definitely help with that aspect of how do we make what the computer vision models are doing. Um, so anyway, to bring that up as well, there's this behavioral sort of capture aspect that I think the human can play a critical role in because you'll never replace, uh, at least not, not anytime long, maybe the Tesla bot, I don't know, we haven't seen that yet, but we'll, we'll never replace everything that uh, the people are doing, but we can definitely augment. And that's that tends to be very much our conversation and the way that we talk with our, our customers. <laughs> I'll, I'll come to autonomy, but um, our friend Aaron asks, um, so the kind of elephant in the room here in, in with uh, with cameras is privacy. And um, and this is more a kind of a technology question. What is that sort of, um, uh, what are kind of potential future technology approaches to, to, to address privacy? So one thing I would add, Ravi, is that we do hear this, especially when you're monitoring people, right? Processes is one thing, but if you're monitoring people, the safety use cases we talked about, Privacy is a concern, if you're doing a facial recognition and identifying the worker and somebody who is not in compliance, for example, reporting to whoever, right? That's an issue. So, and the way, it's not so much a technology thing, but the way customers right now are, are wanting to deal with it is to say that identify the location and, uh, and, and the spot of when the thing happened, but not actually recognize the face and send the picture or uh, as part of a notification. And so, in other words, the supervisor gets a notification as to who, who is actually in compliance, not in compliance with whatever they're looking at, but that, that is not advertised. That's one place. Some others have gone all the way. It depends on the capacity. If it's not a sensitive area, if it's not a sensitive information, they say, you know what, integrate with our access control system. When you see scan a badge, you're not scanning necessarily the face, but you're scanning a badge of the person and identifying if there is an issue there, for example, you know, make a note of it or prevent the access to the building and things like that. But uh, I mean, from a technology perspective, I see that you can obviously put some, you know, you know, blurred images on top, not identify them, but ultimately it's all boiling down to, do you want to recognize the person by name and face, or do you just want to know what is the location, the time, and what was the compliance issue that so you can effectively address it? That, that's how I see it. Yeah, no. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, David. Yep. 
Oh, uh, yeah, sure. I, I, you know, one thing I'll add to that is, uh, you know, the, the question was phrased as, as the elephant in the room. It, it's good. That elephant is going to be in this room for a long time. OK, there's there's things that we can do from a policy perspective. But I was just reading a paper that came out two days ago, fascinating medical paper that that showed with with medical images. You can even you can downsample an image even to four pixels by four pixels and still determine the race of the person through through an x-ray. It's unbelievable. These models really learn these residual features, you know, and, and information, even to our best intent to try to, to de-bias that, denoise that, you know, anonymize it. We still can't completely do it. So, so you know, my honest answer to you is we don't have all the answers. This is going to be an ongoing problem. We're going to be fighting this for a while. There, there's tools that we have today, but but boy, that it, it, it's a legitimate concern. Yeah, and it, uh, I'll, the um, the one thing I'll add is really two uh, two things. One is not it's not even just around privacy; it's also around the ethics. So you have that aspect of uh, the AI component as well, um, and also the devices themselves. Uh, how do you know if somebody hasn't replaced that camera with something else, especially in remote locations, right? So things like device identity become very important. Where and how do you? Uh, bake identity into the overall process. And in many cases, it has to be when the device itself was manufactured. And, and then you need the supporting mechanisms around that. Um, there was a, you see, I have a Q and A question around blockchain. So we won't have time to get into that today, but you know, there, there's plays for technologies like that in that area, but you still have the problem around the security of the device itself. Uh, there, I mean, there are stories of people replacing devices in some remote location and now that camera or that other IOT device or whatever it is is not actually what you expect it to be um, or you know I don't know if it'll be like the movies where you can hang a picture in front of the camera and you know the security guard now looks at that static picture the entire time it's not all if it's quite that but but there are things like that that we do need to be concerned about because the AI ML model doesn't matter how good it is it's only be as good as the data you feed it and, and how how do what role would deep fakes play in this? So switching switching kind of gears, I'm combining two questions here. Um, you know, you can um, there there's at least um, um, you hear about kind of people uh, listening to to machines to to kind of detect their health uh, or anomalies at least. Um, what role can computer vision play there? In in kind of uh, detecting kind of machine health. Right. So we, we have a project like that where we're listening to uh, a machine uh, and actually merging that with um, other, uh, both, both computer vision and non-computer vision related sensors uh, and using the combination of all of those uh, inputs, if you will, to be a determinant of machine health. Um, the idea being that in some cases, the sound is a better indicator than anything that you might actually see. So that it, it's more from at least the use case that we're working on, it's more around the fusion of that uh, with other data sources than it is around any one specific data source. I, I agree with that. In fact, vibration and sound and audio actually gives a better indication about the asset health, the machine health. It's so much so less about computer vision because the machine may not be changing anything much, but all of the pressure, temperature, the sound that comes out of it. So we do vibration analysis to identify if there are anomalies in the machine health. Um, I'll, I'll do a last question and, and uh, I'll come to my kind of favorite topic, which is, you know, we talked about sort of insights and then control and then autonomy. And so as you think about cars, tunneling, robots, um, there's a delivery robot called Tortoise and that's being trialed here uh, uh, for kind of retail uh, stores. What, what do you think, how critical is computer vision for autonomy? Well, so so I, I would say it's absolutely critical. We're on we're on the journey there today. You know, I would say most people today are what they really want today is the control aspect of it, right? Not just the insights and don't, don't just tell me is my part good or bad, right? We we have this manufacturing philosophy at Intel that says you you don't inspect quality into to a product, right? It's only once you understand the root cause and drive some sort of action that eliminates that defect you achieve the true value. So that's why control is so important. The natural extension on that path that, that you, you described from, you know, insights to controls autonomy is absolutely where we're headed. Computer vision will play, play a major role in that. I think that's still, you know, a ways off. There are maybe some niche applications we're tapping today, but absolutely we're, we're, we're headed down that track.
I, I would agree. I mean, it's absolutely critical, but we're still very early on the stage. Um, it's going to a lot, lot more have to come in, but it's it is critical, not just the insights, but as uh, David pointed out, uh, to be able to identify the defects and correct it. That's important, but we're still pretty early on the stage for uh, these robots and uh, autonomy, complete autonomy. Yeah, and I, I would say you can't depend on it though, because again, computer computer vision is just one input, and then what do you do when that's no longer available to you? Right, it, it's foggy. Car can't see. Whatever these things are, it, it can't be the only uh, determinant or input or factor or, or the way in which you're making decisions. So you you will need to augment and enrich that at least at a very core level from a safety perspective. And about these tortoise uh, uh, delivery robots, I heard that they're actually being they have a whole team of people in Mexico who are actually kind of driving them. Uh, uh, okay. And 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 so uh, right now it's not autonomous, but definitely using the camera. Yep. So yep. great! It's it's been a great conversation. There's uh, so much more. There are many questions we didn't get to, um, and some great comments. My uh, our friend Hamid has some great comments. So probably something we should do sometime in the future. And I'm also very keen at some stage to explore how kind of the gig economy, uh, uh, companies like uh, Amazon, uh, Grubhub, uh, Airbnb, how they are using kind of cameras uh, for still images and videos. So I thank you, uh, David Sastri and Nelson for making this a fascinating discussion. Oh, thank you thank so you much. Yep. Wonderful conversation. Thank yep. you. Thanks to all. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All. Thank you. All right. thank, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.